Uh, hi, welcome to um, our session from Kinko Bioworks. We're, it's called Creating Life at Scale with AWS. That's what we do. Uh, who are we? Um, Ginkgo Bioworks, I'm Dave Treff. I'm the head of IT and DevOps. Ginkgo Bioworks, the organism company, and also, I think, the coolest company on the planet. Um, and what I'm going to do today is talk about what it is we do, um, how we do it, and the unreal scale that we do it at, and then talk about how um, IT and DevOps keeps up with it and actually is able to um, be a real um, integrated partner with the scientists in doing the, uh, the work that we do. The um, history of Ginkgo actually goes way back, um, so I'm gonna start there. I have to, uh, one of the guidelines is I have to tell you who I am. So um, I started programming computers when I was 15 years old like everybody here probably, some of you probably started when you were two, but when I started, uh, this guy was the president, um, the 36th president of the United States, if you don't who, know who that is. Um, this um, sort of famous music festival was 10 months in the future, and the computer that I programmed was the Digital Equipment Corporation PDP-8, 12-bit words, 1024 addressable, the only um, storage medium that was available was paper tape that's like tape with holes in it. Come on, oh, there we go. The next one, this is the IBM 1620. Um, it was a very interesting machine. It's from the 50s. You can see partially a crackle finish on the typewriter. Um, the, um, this machine was interesting because it was not binary, it was actually a decimal machine. Its nickname was the Cadet, can't add, doesn't even try. It did everything with uh, table lookup and you know, that, sort of, that didn't have any legs at all. Then this one, this is real, I love this one. This is the 1130, NASA bought a ton of these. A lot of formica and that thing in the middle, it looks like it could be on uh, you know, any spaceship in any uh, movie. And then, my first computer job, that's the um, IBM 36020. Um, I was a third shift operator. I would go in, start a program, put my head down, and go to sleep. So then I went on to do a whole bunch of other stuff. This is, I actually did stuff in my life, as opposed to now, which is you know, pontificating and begging people to do stuff. Um, that's me down at the bottom there. Um, that's in 1977. I have a big, thick printout on my lap with you know, green, white, green, white, green, white, and it's a, a 4chan compiler and it's written in assembly language. It was not fun doing it back then, let me tell you. But at the same time I was doing that, the guy on the right, Tom Knight, was um, in grad school at MIT. That's the Lisp machine that he is wire wrapping. Um, that was his master's project. Tom went on to become a MIT um, professor in electrical engineering and computer science, worked on the first ARPANET TIPS and IMPS that um, were the backbone of the ARPANET. And then suddenly, in the early 90s, he said, gee whiz, you know, that DNA stuff, I wonder if it really is programmable. So that's what Tom says, 21st century will be the century of engineering biology. and he was, along with George Church at Harvard, um, one of the inventors of what's called synthetic biology, which I'll get to in a second. So they started the company. Tom started the company with four MIT grads. We started in 2008. Um, we've got 290 employees now. We've got, that's eh, like a billion dollars or something. Uh, we've got over 140 robots. We are number eight on the Y Combinator list. Um, we are the only biotech, in fact, we were the first biotech that Y Combinator um, ever funded back in 2014, and our valuation right now is $4.2 billion. Why is that important? Well, you'll see it takes a lot of money to do what we do. So I want you to take a look at this. This is a typical desk. I don't have a desk. I have a lazy boy in a corner. Um, you think I'm kidding. 
Um, I like the film camera too, but on here, which is the most advanced technology on that desk? It's the plant. <laughs> the plant self-repairs, self-assembles, self-replicates, it's renewable, and it's scalable. All of those things. Remember there was, I think probably about five or six years ago, there was all this hoopla when a um, 3D printer printed out a working 3D printer, right? That took a real lot of work. The plant, that does that every day. And that's our motto, make biology easier to engineer. That is what we do, that's our motto. And we do it like this, we engineer little bugs for fermentation. We've got a lot of projects, 40 different organisms. We call them chassis. That includes things like E. coli and MRSA and um, some other ones, a lot of yeasts and molds. We basically do specialty chemicals. Uh, new ones are novel. And basically, the important thing is we develop organisms that sense and respond to and alter their environment. This is very important because we want these to make things when they're brewing, right? So the interesting thing about us is just about every one of our projects does something like replace petroleum source chemicals or animal sourced food products or uh, lessens reliance on endangered or at-risk plants, thing, you know, at-risk plants like the banana, coffee, cacao, all of those are at risk in climate change right now, uh, as an example. Um, bioremediation of hazardous waste, you want to get rid of that PCB in the ground, why can't we build a bug that'll eat it? Novel medicines, cell-based therapeutics, we're starting to do that stuff, and then agriculture without harmful fertilizers or other chemicals. We are mission driven. We literally want to save the world with biology and also have a lot of fun doing it. So let's talk about, now that we know what synthetic biology is, we make organisms that make stuff, let's talk about how we do it. We have foundries that com basically compile and debug DNA code. Um, synthetic DNA is inserted into the genomes of, let's say, a yeast, and it's tested first at a nanoliter, then at microliter, then at millimeter. And when we get up to 24 millimeters, milliliters, then you know, we know we've got something and we can get it up to into the thousands of gallons. The, we, it's all done with robots though, that's the cool thing. And it's robots that we make ourselves and there's a lot of reasons for doing that. So we have a, basically it's a service oriented architecture in the uh, foundry. The first step design, a bunch of just unbelievable, scary, smart people that um, design DNA using our custom software, a lot of which they build themselves. We, they put in an order for DNA, the DNA comes back, and a team called Build um, actually takes it and sticks it into organisms and makes sure that they different the organisms are actually viable. Then we go into test, where we're testing, we're trying to figure out which of maybe 1,000 or 2,000 or 4,000 different variations of DNA is actually going to produce whatever it is we're going to produce. And then finally, it ends up in fermentation. That's where we take it from milliliters to 24 milliliters and once we're able to get something that is really fermenting in a way that we're producing a lot of the stuff we want to produce, then we start talking about getting it at, to other team called the deployment team that gets that, um, gets it up to, you know, in the thousands of gallons, which we also can do. So anyway, four services, and there's other services too. Um, sequencing, sequencing is something that just about every service needs. High throughput screening, um, protein engineering for when the DNA is not expressing very well and they call the protein engineers in and say, uh, look, we're not making enough of this goop 
and they try to figure out if the proteins that the DNA is, are uh, expressing into are the right ones. Um, but um, design, build, test, ferment, um, each of these is its own service with its own people devoted to it. And it sounds kind of familiar, huh? Kind of like Amazon Web Services. So that's the first key to our ability to scale. It's just like Amazon. We've got a bunch of independent services that other services use. The other thing is that the foundry, what we do, the way the business works is, um, if we, you come to us, you're a paint company, you come to us and say, uh, we want to get rid of a petroleum-based chemical that's really gross, and we want you guys, our scientists think that you guys can brew it for us. And we say, okay, and we go and we teach some yeast to, instead of making beer or bread, to make paint. And we get it all the way to where we're making lots of paint, and then we give it back to the paint company and say, here you go. But we also keep all that intellectual property, right? What, is, what that means is, if there's some discoveries, and there will be discoveries, that we have when we're trying to get yeast to produce paint, we can use it when we're trying to get yeast to produce cannabinoids or animal-esque protein. So that's our business model. That's how it works. Um, and now let's talk about the, the scale. Everybody remembers Moore's Law, right? Um, the cost of computing comes down by um, a half every 18 months. You'll notice that, um, and this only starts in 2000, not back in the 1990s when Craig Venter was first doing sequencing, but the cost of DNA sequencing itself has come down to, you know, around, it's actually under $1,000 now, a run. Um, we, we do thousands of sequencing runs every month. We're able to just, you know, geez, I think this isn't, uh, this isn't making any pain. Um, let's sequence it and see if it mutated. So we just were able to do that. And at the same time, DNA synthesis, what we call printing DNA, has come down also. So we have this thing about a year and a half ago, right before I joined the company, um, we'd had the Y Combinator summer in 2014, and we said, um, gee, um, I wonder how we're doing. And so we went back to 2014 and we looked at what we were doing, how our output was improving over time, and we called it Knight's Law instead of Moore's Law. So the cost to genetically engineer a cell falls by 50%, and the number of designs tested grows threefold every year. We have been doing this since 2014, the results are not completely in right now, but it looks like we're going to make it too in 2019. But let's look at how it goes. So the cost of engineered cell testing is dropping by 50% a year. This is actual, this is our real numbers. So our cost to do this stuff goes down. At the same time, we're, the number of strain tests, the amount of DNA that we're ordering, by the way, we do make some of our own DNA, but mostly we buy it from places like Twist Biosciences. We'll be talking about that in a second. And also the number of liquid transfers. Anybody that's a scientist in the, organ in the audience knows that that's really what um, science on the lab is all about, is moving liquids all around. And so that's something we do a lot with robots. It's something that we measure. And the number of strain tests. That's the tests of actual organisms also going up by about four times a year. So this is why. Um, Companies like Kronos and Genomatica come to us. Kronos is the um, cannabis grower in Canada. They came to us and said, look, there's 100 different kinds of cannabinoids, and we only know about what half a dozen of them do. And by growing plants, we can't possibly reliably be able to extract these for testing. So can you brew them for us? And we said, yes, we can. I mean, one of the interesting ones 
is that there's several kinds of THC. It's THC A through C, and there might be more of them. Well, THC A, the one uh, that you're most familiar with, um, smoking weed, is the one that gives you the munchies. There's another one, and I think it's THC C, that suppresses appetite. Now, that would be kind of an interesting thing to experiment for a drug, to look at for a drug, now, wouldn't it? So that's one of the things we're doing. The other thing is that if there are processes that we know we can do, that we think are winners, and there's nobody to buy it, we start companies. So Motif Foodworks is a company that is producing animal protein. Um, Join Bio is a joint venture with Bayer where um, they are trying to develop some, uh, a biome that you can coat on a seed that gets planted um, in the ground and then fixes nitrogen so that you don't have to use fertilizer. Oh, and by the way, um, earlier there was a um, announcement that was made that Ginkgo, along with a bunch of other companies and with the help of Y Combinator, um, started up another incubator called Petri. What Petri's supposed to be is an incubator for very, very young bioscience companies. And basically, like it could be two founders in a garage, uh, companies that could poss never possibly be able to do um, experiments at the scale that we can do it, um, or uh, may not even be able to afford a lab at all. Um, we, what we will do is when uh, these companies come through the uh, Petri incubator, we will do foundry services for them, dis do discoveries for them at their direction in, um, for um, equity positions in their company. So there's about, I think there's about 12 companies other than Ginkgo that are involved. It's called Petri.bio. They're taking um, applications starting in February. So anybody who's in that world um, we can help you. All right, so we've talked about how we do, we do um, synthetic biology, and we're doing a lot of it, and we're doing more of a lot of a lot every year. But what I want to do is tell you three stories that talk about the kind of scale that we work at. So there was a bunch of us, a bunch of scientists that were working on this project with a bunch of other companies to, um, that were doing some very, very heavy duty uh, deep learning models. So they got together for a meeting and they were talking and one of the vendor number one said, well, how many did you guys do? We did 735. Oh yeah, said another one, another company. We did 1,000. We did a thousand, we trained a thousand models. How many did you guys do, Ginkgo? Uh, 15 million. Story number two. This one I was there for, and my boss Flo was there for this one too, and I think Flo actually asked the question. So we had a, a vendor in, some of the scientists wanted us to um, evaluate a software as a service vendor for you know, a limb system or a compound registry or uh, notebooks or um, safety or something like that. Anyway, so they were in and we were talking to them and I think my boss Flo said, so in your uh, database, your biggest customer, how many things, compounds, uh, DNA snippets, um, enzymes, proteins, are you um, storing for the largest customer? And the two of them conferred and they said, well, I think about half a million. And one of our scientists got a big smile and said, can you handle half a million a day? Because that's what we need. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about how DNA design is done. DNA design is done by these uh, about a dozen scary, scary smart people that do custom heavy duty machine learning. It's novel machine learning and deep learning. They're making this up themselves. Um, and when they moved to AWS, 
from running on this monolithic, huge um, in-house machine that was under somebody's desk, and we got them into AWS, and they started you know, running this stuff in parallel. Well, they could spin up 4,000 machines. It would take like three hours, and it would cost $8,000. It's P2s and other you know, big stuff. And um, then they would um, they come out with 4,000 possible DNA variations that could use to make whatever it is for a customer. And in the DNA design program, there's a button that they push, and an order goes to Twist Biosciences in Emeryville for DNA for that. Usually, that order costs something on the order of $200,000. And it comes in a box, not in these boxes. These boxes are, are, have some other lab DNA stuff in them. But it comes in a box. It comes FedEx. $200,000. One of um, the DevOps people who comes in early all the time, one time there was a UPS driver, said, uh, here, can you sign for this? No. No, 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 no. Uh, you got to wait until it op you know, the loading dock opens up. Um, the thing that's interesting about this is the way that they're approaching this problem in silico the ideal way for this to uh, DNA design to go is instead of getting 4,000 possibilities DNA, maybe you get 1,000 possibilities of DNA. So your order is $50,000. When it comes in, it takes one quarter of, the, of all of the operations in the lab. Build, test, fermentation, and that's because our models are better, and we're able to actually predict what, the DNA, what kind of DNA is going to give us the yield of the paint. So in DNA design alone and in silico alone, we have the power for, to fuel two years of Knight's Law because we're doing one quarter of the operations and we're driving the cost down by a factor of four. So this is a very good example of the way that Amazon Web Services can allow us to continue to track along Knight's Law, tripling our output every year, and having the cost per operation. All right, so let's talk about how um, IT and DevOps works. Um, I run it, so this is very personal to me. So you imagine you're me, and you're working in that building, my lazy boy is in, the, in that corner right there. So imagine you're me, I'm running DevOps, our output triples every year. I gotta do a three year plan. Say what? How do I do that? I have sequencers, we get new sequencers all the time. Right? They grab half the bandwidth of our network. Every year, we upgrade our network, and they grab half the bandwidth of our network, the new ones. And then as far as data goes, we actually don't have a lot of big, we don't have big data yet. But within a year or so, we're going to be generating a petabyte a year. And according to Knight's Law, that means we're going to be generating three petabytes the following year and then nine petabytes the year after that. And so here's an illustration. Here's 2014, um, when we first started measuring this stuff. So that's Knight's Law, that's times three. Then it goes to nine in 2016. Then it goes to 27 in 2017. 81 in 2018, that's when I joined the company. So we're already doing that. And then, 243, and then that's this year, and then in 2020 we get over, we get to close to 1,000, and I don't even wanna, I didn't even try to render that. So that's what I have to deal with, right? That kind of growth. There's other requirements at Ginkgo which are just Ginkgo-ish. Obviously we have a service architecture. There are demands from different teams for different stuff. 
Um, there are bottlenecks between different services that we have to help solve. The scientists work on multiple projects simultaneously. So they're working on paint, and then they go and they're working on cannabinoids, and then they're going to work on meat, and then you know, blah, blah, blah. And so what that means is they, whoops, sorry. So the other thing is they can't, there can't be any interruptions in service, and the data can have, data latency has to be zero. I mean, I kid you not, these folks, all right, the sequencing run just ran, where's my data? Um, we have a data warehouse that we're running in Redshift, and we had to get it updating every 15 minutes because every hour was too slow. Um, and the other thing is, if you're familiar with stuff like Jupiter, um, what these folks are used to doing, they can be at work in the building, and they're working on five Jupiter sessions at once, and the Jupiter sessions are live, sharing data with other people that have Jupiter sessions open. And so we have you know, thousands of open sessions all the time. Can't go down, uh-uh, because uh, you know, then we have cranky scientists. So, and the other thing is we have hundreds and hundreds of sensors on everything that we have to also worry about. We're also, we're on a dock, right? There's our building. That's a dry dock. That's a 100-year-old warehouse building that we're in. I think all of the roof leaks have finally been taken care of. The, um, that's a dry dock. That's a Navy ship that's being outfitted across the street. We are on a dock, uh, and it floods. Um, I like the icebergs. This is um, Seaport Boulevard. This is around the corner from us. Um, a year ago, last February, and there's our building in the background um, in what looks like a mere five inches of water. We had three feet in the basement. So we have to deal with that too. Now, that's a whole other talk, how to, you know, <laughs> how to do IT on a dock. Um, I'm not going to give it. But anyway, I wanted to show you the team that we have. Everything at Ginkgo is run very, very lean. Just try to hire somebody. The, um, the gauntlet that you run through to hire somebody is incredible. One of the reasons is because of Moore's Law, right? Um, we need to half the cost of um, every operation every year. Well, the more people that you have, you're not, it's fighting against that. So we're supporting 300 scientists with eight IT DevOps people. We only have three desktop people, and that's a whole other uh, discussion. But anyway, if you look at our DevOps people, we've got how do we support major workloads? We've got 30 applications. We've got 20 software engineers whining. We've got 10 DNA designers, a dozen DNA fabricators that are working on two shifts, a dozen robot engineers, 140 robots, and lots of random scientists, and we only have five DevOps engineers. What I will say about our DevOps engineers is that's the best DevOps team in Boston. Um, we have people on the team who've done multiple migrations to AWS in HIPAA environments, GXP environments. I actually have both before I, I came to Ginkgo. Um, and are all crackerjack um, Linux administrators. So um, we're not a lot of DevOps talent out there is somebody that used to be a React programmer that wants to start doing DevOps, and um, that's, we don't want to hire that person. What we do, do actually, we have our, our ad for um, DevOps people says, we want Linux admins, you don't have to know DevOps, we will train you. And that's actually working, by the way. So how do we do it? We do it the Ginkgo way, extreme automation. When we formed the team, we, got, we had two precepts. One of them is automate everything, everything. And two, if you have to go to the console to fix a problem, you also have to open a JIRA ticket to go and fix the automation so you don't have to go to the console anymore. 
Um, we're doing everything in CloudFormation now because you, you actually can use it. Um, it's actually, right now, it's, you know, Terraform and CloudFormation are going like this. CloudFormation is, is winning right now. Uh, we're using Ansible um, and a bunch of other tools. And when I, mean, when I say extreme automation, it means like there's a Jenkins job, you push a button, and an account is made in G Suite so that we get an email address that comes back. We open the case using the API to create another account in our organization. That comes back usually in about 15 minutes. At that point, at that point we build this. The way we do stuff is we have a base model of what an account looks like, and it has one VPC in it in the beginning, which is usually a development VPC, and it's got some RDS, it's got some EC2, it's got load balancing, and it has also uh, the transit gateway. We'll get to the transit gateway soon. The transit gateway has a, a, been a tremendously enabling um, service for us. Um, it's allowed us to get rid of the VPC peering that you need in order to transfer control and data across VPCs, which ends up being an n-squared problem. We're probably going, right now, I think we've got probably 50 accounts. We're going to have well over 100 pretty soon. Um, and by the way, the multi, going to multi-accounts, that's, that's an AWS best practice. It's really good because you're getting all of the account guardrails you need to keep everybody safe. So what we do is for any application that we're doing, and we started doing this when we were moving applications out of the uh, desktop computers <laughs> that they were running on, um, we build identical dev, staging, and production um, accounts, and they're the base ones. Um, each of the EC2 instances has Docker and Rancher on it, as a matter of fact. Um, this particular one needs Elastic Cache. It also needs um, Elastic Search. So that, that automation is done for that application. And finally, there's some stuff that you do not want to put into every one of those accounts. Um, one of those things is Route 53 DNS. You know, you can now run, you know, Route 53 is very, very full featured. You can actually run it and you can, you know, have extend it off of your internal address system or not. Um, but if you put DNS, uh, Route 53 will end up costing about $2,000 a year. Um, if you have 100 accounts, that's a lot of money. So you want to put that into a common account that with Transit Gateway, everybody's connected. You want the CloudWatch, all the logs, um, the monitoring logs, you want it all in buckets in the, in the um, central, the common account, um, Cloud Directory, Active Directory, you want that there. Um, if you have any uh, NAT Gateway, you definitely want in only one place. That's a security requirement. Um, you don't want NAT gateways everywhere. People will get into a lot of trouble very quickly. Um, and um, also there's an extra EC2 instance that um, we're, in this example, we're running a time service on. Um, but this is, the, this is a very important thing because you, it, unless you do this, you're going to make, if you put all this stuff into every account, it's going to cost you a ton of money. And... Um, it's going to make you a lot less secure. All right, so now we're going to talk about sequencing. Um, that's uh, Daenerys Duran, that's her real name, Queen of Dragons, who is the leader of the DevOps team doing a happy dance next to a bunch of sequencers. Um, these, as Tom Knight told us when actually we were going to do this shoot and we were trying to get the, um, any um, identifying or you know, IP information off of the screens. He helped us do that. He was wandering by. And he said, what these things are is some very tiny 
very fast, very sensitive microscopes. You're not supposed to touch them while they're working. Um, you just kind of stay away. But one of the reasons why um, NGS is one of our favorites is we use it to size the network. If we calculate what's going, what our network bandwidth going into storage is, if we were running them all full blast and then double it and then add a little fudge factor, we're going to be good with our network. So that's one reason why we love it. And it also demonstrates the awesome power of AWS services. One of our engineers, one of the software folks who's actually a, a computational biologist, um, Flo asked, and his boss, Jamie, asked him to go through and take a look at um, all of the different um, clustering technologies, analytical technologies, you know, like Slurm, like NextSeq, like, um, what is it, Luigi, you know, all this. And so this was his comments on them. He basically hates them all, and he didn't want to use them. And so we did it the ginkgo way, with batch, not with EKS, not with anything really fancy, with batch. Uh, one of the things that's um, interesting about this is not the fact that we're doing batch, so every time we get a new strain, there's a strain we, um, we it, queue it up in batch and you know, run a cluster, make it part of a cluster, and then we push the data into the code base. Um, the thing, we want to point out the uh, vast data storage device that we have that's replacing the um, <clears throat> three-letter um, storage device that um, we have now. Um, the vast is brand new technology. We were, we were customer number one. Um, they're a great company in New York. Basically, the they solved mass storage with um, consumer grade SSD and very high speed networking. The slowest that it will go is at 40 gigabits per second. The other thing is that um, all of the code, it, the routing is all done in code. The uh, squeezing of the data is all done in code. It all runs in Docker. It could run on a machine. It doesn't really matter. Um, and you get 800 gigabytes squashed down to something like that the equivalent of 1.4 petabytes, and it's only a few hundred thousand dollars. That's the stuff right there. Now let's talk about our favorite AWS services. Really, um, there's only a few that we use over and over again. Direct Connect, obviously, uh, very important. We have two. Um, 20 gigabit per second connections into Virginia and another 20 gigabits, that's two 10 gigabit connections into Cleveland that we use. We try, we need, because we're doing analytics, we need to do arbitrage, um, like sort of crude arbitrage. The, uh, if a P2s, if a bunch of P2s aren't available in Virginia, we can probably get them in Ohio. Um, Transit Gateway, again, solved the um, N-squared problem um, with interconnections. Fantastic stuff. It was out a month when we started using it, and lo and behold, it actually worked really, really well. Um, we're using the um, ECR for our um, Docker registry. And then the other stuff that's very important is stuff for us. I, concentrate more on operations than on anything else. And it's to the point now where Amazon Web Services has actually got enough um, cloud management service in a bunch of different services that you're actually able to do it without something like Datadog. So that's what we're doing. So a combination of organizations, config, and obviously CloudWatch, CloudTrail, um, systems Manager, uh, Control Tower will come out and be running soon, we hope. And then obviously there's all the uh, security stuff that um, has come out in the past couple of years, which we think is really phenomenal. We're using a lot of it. But Batch is the clear winner. Now, I, when I was planning this out, um, this was going to be like a really cool thing uh, because, see, you don't need to do it. 
you know, this is ginkgo innovation right here, using the simple tool and getting the most out of it. Well, um, I was at a life sciences um, AWS gathering uh, yesterday that was all afternoon, a bunch of startups. Some of the folks are actually here that were there. And there were on the order of seven or eight presentations, and every single one of them was using Batch for their analytics pipeline. Um, so I am very humbled uh, to <laughs> all of, with all of you, but it's, um, it's nice to know, actually, that we, we're doing the right thing. This sort of validated it for us. So we couldn't scale without AWS. You know, no other cloud provider has, has got the type and multiplicity of services. Um, you know, there's places that go, oh man, you know, you gotta use Google because, you know, Tesseract and DeepMind, we don't need those, we need everything. And we need scalability um, and, as well, a multitude of services that our folks can just grab onto and use. The other thing is that Amazon Web Services has the fanatical customer, oh, I call it more like service orientation, it's customer devotion, I think is more like it. Uh, the only way that we can actually achieve Knight's Law is through the customer service that we're getting. Um, we also have a number of partners. I talked about the vast uh, Markley's data center downtown in Boston. It is a world-class data center. That's where the AWS points of presence for Direct Connect are, so we just are a short fiber run from our cage to their cage. The Amazon cages, by the way, very impressive. Gotta be Faraday cages. And they've got all this equipment around the outside so you can't look in. So unfortunately, I can't tell you what's in them, uh, but it's definitely, we don't have it. Red River, uh, our system integrator, um, also our VAR, they've been very, very helpful, especially with our networking. We had a lot of trouble with networking that we've turned around with also the help of Cisco. Um, we would not be able to get into AWS, much less operate anything without the help of these um, hard, more hardware-oriented folks. So, wrapping up, the three keys to AWS success. This is a little bit of advice. An enterprise service agreement, number one. Number two, an enterprise service agreement. Number three, an enterprise service agreement. It's the best $15,000 a month you'll spend if as an organization you can afford it. But what it gives you is access to TAMs. They are your personal technical representatives. They come and visit you at least once a week. They sit down with your users, help them with their problems. Anytime we run into a bug or an issue, even though we've got the most experienced AWS team, in our DevOps team in-house, we need help all the time. So why get an enterprise service agreement? Because sorry, AWS is hard. You know, it's really easy to put up a web page on S3 and, um, you know, a little three-tier web app that is exposed to the internet, but trying to do the kind of stuff that we're doing, even with very experienced people, um, the enterprise service agreement is absolutely necessary. I will also say this, by the way, that um, even if you don't have one, you do have an AWS rep and use the rep. Use the rep, lean on the rep. Say, you need help with something. Um, I need access to a um, service team because I found a bug. Um, I need help configuring something. Your rep will help you, and the more you do, you'll get more and more service again because of the fanatical customer service orientation. And it's not an enterprise service agreement, but you really, if, if you don't lean on your rep, you're not getting everything you need out of AWS, and you're not going to be as successful as you could be. Um, Finally, some best practices, multi-account strategy, we talked about that. There's compliance guidelines. Um, when I was at Bank of America, um, back in the aughts, we were uh, at the enterprise level flipping out because there were all of these privacy 
you know, data privacy rules coming where Malaysia and Greece were actually the most restrictive, but Singapore had its own problems, and then there was the EU, and then there was you know, the US, obviously, all of the different, um, you know, between FedRAMP and um, the CFR and GXP and HIPAA and everything. They are compliant to everything. They, Amazon has got a room full of lawyers, and it's probably a sea of lawyers, who do nothing but try to figure out how to be compliant to everything in the world. Even at Bank of America, we could not get that done. That was a daunting problem. And that's when Bank of America was fortune number four is when I worked there. So um, definitely lean on them. Look, look to Amazon for compliance. The, um, there's more and more services that are being added to the uh, what's allowed for HIPAA, I think, probably every day, it looks like. Um, cloud management services and the guidelines definitely use organizations, config, CloudWatch, blah, 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 blah. Um, you really need to do it. The uh, final thing is, you know, AWS is just another data center, ultimately. Security is still your problem. Um, I don't know about you, but we have a lot of friends all over the world coming to visit us through the internet, trying to get to our intellectual property, trying to get into our stuff. Um, they're doing it to you too. So you really need to do everything that you do in a data center, whether it's intrusion detection, anomaly detection, whatever. You need to do it in your AWS accounts. Um, there's a lot of help out there. There's a lot of stuff in the marketplace. Everything that you can buy, every security product that Cisco has for on-prem stuff is also available in the cloud for, um, and you can run them in EC2 instances, and that's just an example, but you really do need to do that. Here's one last next level tip. You try a service and you don't like it, open a case, complain loudly, Try it again in a year. Probably works. CloudFormation did not work four years ago. CloudFormation is excellent now and because they listened. And so it's up to us to hold AWS to account and get them to um, do what we need to do. So again, that's me, Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, we really have a lot of fun. AWS is helping us. By the way, we are hiring. If there's any CFOs out there, um, <laughs> we're trying to hire one. And I'm always looking for people. It's, we have a lot of fun out there on the dock. And um, definitely, if you have a yen to, to do AWS and do biology at incredible scale, then uh, Ginkgo is the place to do it. Thank you. You're very kind. <laughs>